Um, and Phil was formulating a question I rudely interrupted. Um, I was just going to bring up a question. Uh, I'm sure everyone had the experience that one did wake up from a dream and say, oh my God, I can't believe we just, I just had that dream. And then 10 seconds later, they forget all about it. Mm -hmm. Maybe it could be the case that we just do that with all our dreams that we have all the time. And then so that we're just immediately forgetting them. Yeah, yeah. I think there's something maybe that, that to be said about this, that if you really want to remember a dream, I've been told, like, you need to write it down, talk, tell somebody about it. Uh, if you don't do it right away, you're going to forget it. Maybe one can try to argue that dream we could remember our dreams if we worked on it or something like that. The question would be, would that still prove that we think all the time? Yeah? Wouldn't... Wouldn't the whole thing about like remembering dreams and things like that, would that would directly relate to memory, not so much so consciousness or thought? So I guess like I guess that's kinda where I get stuck with the whole like, oh, you forget if like if you forget a dream or if you remember it, it's like I still kinda feel like you're thinking either way, even if you're remembering or not remembering it. And like memory is kind of a different substance would would Locke agree that like memory isn't directly related to like our thought process or it, it kind of depends. Like I think that he would want to say that there it's not a necessary connection. There can be connections through memory. Okay. So you could have multiple thoughts and not necessarily remember all of them. But the thing, this is what he's ultimately trying to get at, is that what makes you the same person across time is sort of a collection of remembered experiences. Okay. Like I said, more on this fun topic later. Yeah? Back to the, the mind coming in out of existence. That yeah. I had. Could it be argued that, like, let's say, I, I'm thinking uh, in like the frames of like a, a computer program. Sense. But um, you have a computer program running, right? And if you turn off the power, the computer program ceases to be. But you still have the hardware. That's like the foundation of the computer program itself. So you could turn it back on, it still is. So could it be argued that the foundation is still there, even though the concept is still gone? This would be kind of a different view. I mean, this is, there's a view like this out there. It's not a view that's held by Descartes. It's not a view held by Locke. Probably not a view that really was popularized until within the last hundred years, which thinks of consciousness as sort of being a property of the brain, but not but not being a substance. So that consciousness is sort of, if you will, a feature of the kind of thing our brain is under the right circumstances. So it's sort of it's more like the analogy you're kind of giving, which is that the brain is the hardware. And all, when we go to sleep, it's just sort of like we turn off the machine in some ways, and then everything is still able to run just when the power comes back on. Um, it's a different view than what Locke is giving and than what Descartes is giving, but it's a view that, that I, I do think that there's some uh, that people have today. And the key difference would be what you're describing would make consciousness a feature of like the brain, whereas these other people are trying to argue that. Okay. Consciousness is like in a complete. It is like a different thing. Other thoughts before we move on to the next section. This is um, essentially um, takes us all the way up to page three twenty-eight here. So all of chapter one, book two. Any questions about any of that? I feel like we move really quickly through a lot of dense text in here. I hope that my overview and what we do in class makes sense of this to everybody. Um, but if there are passages or things in here that I'm skipping over that you really don't know what to make of, I'd be happy to you know, go over some of that and bring clarity. Or if there were just interesting things in here you wanted to talk about that I just didn't give you the opportunity to, this is your chance. So let's talk then about book two, chapter two. And here he talks about the nature of simple ideas. Um, simple ideas 
are the most basic ideas that can be thought in isolation from other ideas. What does that mean? Actually, let me start with a complex idea. An apple is a complex idea. It's composed of several ideas. It's composed of the idea of redness, roundness, sweetness, and hardness. You take away, so what would be a simple idea? A simple idea would just be one of those things. The redness alone. The roundness alone. The hardness or the sweetness. Any of those things taken by itself is a simple idea. And if you think about it, your simple ideas are not composed of any other ideas. It's not like your idea of redness. When you think about like the, the bright color of red, that's just a very simple idea. There's no, it's not made up of anything else. Could you then say that a simple idea is sort of like the essence of a thing? Or is that? Not necessarily. Okay. It might be, I mean, these would be like the building blocks of how we think about things, like apples. So you wouldn't want to say, for instance, the essence of being an apple is to be red. Okay, because that would be more complex. Well, partly because we think apples can also be green. And there might be other okay. things that make something an apple. It's just, in this particular case, this one happens to be red. So the difference between simple and complex is that complex ideas are combinations of ideas. So once again, an apple is a complex idea because it's, when you think about an apple, you're thinking about several ideas joined together. You're thinking of the unification of redness, roundness, sweetness, firmness, all of those in one. Whereas a simple idea is just the redness considered on its own, or the hardness considered on its own. Um, simple ideas cannot be created or destroyed in the sense that, think, I don't mean this like metaphysically, I mean this like in the sense of how we acquire them. You can, you can only acquire those simple ideas through sensation and reflection. You're never going to get a new, simple uh, idea in, um, apart from experience. The implication for this, then, is that the only truly original part of human creativity consists in repeating, comparing, and combining simple ideas in a potentially infinite number of ways. So you, there's a sense in which Locke is saying you cannot have an original thought. You can't... This is the sense in which he means that. You can't think of a color that you've never experienced. So nobody can just sit back and dream up, you know, I just thought of a brand new color. No, you can't. You can't think of a new sound, like a new note, besides an, a sound or, you know, a note that you've already heard. Um, you can't think of, you know, a taste, what something would taste like apart from all the tastes that you've had. The closest that you can do is you can join together other experiences you've had and sort of create combinations that maybe have never been combined before. But those combinations are going to be the results of uh, simple ideas that you got through experience. You didn't create the simple ideas. Um, so one of the things that he points out is that you can't even imagine or conceive of some idea or quality um, associated with an object besides those that are associated with our five senses. Like you can't, this is what I was saying, where you can't think of a new color besides what you've already experienced. Some people like this. Some people are kind of put off by the thought that maybe we're not as creative and original as we would like to think we are. Locke, um, this also is helpful for thinking about other things. So, one potential problem that people could raise for Locke's empiricism is that we can think about ideas we've never experienced, such as the idea of a golden mountain. Nobody has seen a mountain made of gold. But you have experienced, you know, the idea of gold through simpler things, and you've experienced the idea of mountains, so where do we come up with an idea of a golden mountain? Well, it's a complex idea that we create. We don't create it brand new. We create it from the simple ideas we got through experience. Since we've already experienced gold and we've experienced mountains, we can just join those two ideas in our mind. Um, 
You know, we can think about purple dragons. Where do we get the idea of a purple dragon? You've never experienced one, I hope. You get that through the same kind of process that you through you have simple ideas like of lizards and of uh, you know winged creatures, and you're able to in your and, and purple things, and you're able to sort of extrapolate from these different ideas you do have. You can create out of those simple ideas a complex one that would be like a dragon. So like if you like looked up a picture of a purple dragon, like saw that picture of a purple dragon. That's technically not like experiencing like what one would look like. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. Instead of just picturing one in your head, actually like looking at another person's. So if your first idea of a dragon came through like seeing a picture or a movie, yeah. that would work. So the okay. question would be, where did that guy come up with the idea of a purple yeah. dragon? But for you looking at it, that would already. be fine. Okay. In our day and age, we're able to we get all sorts of interesting ideas just through you know the internet and. Uh, movies. Mm -hmm. what, what about um, like <laughs> extending like the range of simple ideas? Like they have like um, like ultraviolet or infrared mm -hmm. colors. Is that I don't know how to really how does that factor into this? Well, this is gonna maybe come up in the next section we're gonna look at. But in a way, we don't have I we don't have direct ideas of like infrared color or ultraviolet color. That those are things that are not that we we don't know what those colors look like, right? Um, maybe some animals do. We um, still have like the idea of them, just not, not the color. That's right. So our idea of them is not really of them directly. It's more of them insofar as they cause our instruments to do certain things. We create devices that measure these things, and we say, oh, whatever you know, ultraviolet does this on you know causes my instrument that measures wavelengths of light to register this way. So that's what ultraviolet is. Whereas when you talk about red, we don't typically think of red as, oh, it's that thing that causes this device to measure wavelengths of light a certain way. We say, no, I know what red is directly. Yeah. So if you could, like, let's say, engineer someone so they could see more colors, mm -hmm. would that be considered having more simple ideas? Yeah. No. I, I think so. Because oh, I think they would have an ideas about, like, what ultraviolet colors are that we don't really know. I mean, think about this. Compare your vision with somebody who's born colorblind. They might have some idea of like what red and blue and green are. Like in terms of, I know stop signs are supposed to be red. Everyone tells me that. I know that you know red is supposed to be darker than pink. But they don't really know what red is in the same way you and I, if you're not colorblind, know what red is. Um, that would be the same analogy if we were able to create people, you know, genetically engineer or modify their eyes or something to where they can see ultraviolet. They would kind of be like, I know what, what ultraviolet colors are in a way you don't really know. So this takes us then to the topic of the difference between primary and secondary qualities. Um, so this is where we skip ahead to chapter 7 here. I had you skip over chapters 3, 4, 5, and 6. Um, so um, let's take a look at section 2 here. And I want, us to, I want you to be thinking about this question as we read through this. What does Locke mean when he writes, it being one thing to perceive and know the idea of white or black, and quite another to examine what kind of particles they must be and how arranged in the surfaces to make any object appear white or black. Um, so, um, make sure I get the. Sorry, this should be. Sorry, this should be chapter eight. I have this on the wrong thing. So look on three thirty-two. And I'm just going to read all of section 2 there on 332. So he says, Thus the ideas of heat and cold, light and darkness, white and black, motion and rest, are equally clear and positive ideas in the mind, though perhaps some of the causes which produce them are barely privations and subjects from which our senses derive those ideas. These the understanding and its view of them considers all as distinct positive ideas without taking notice of the causes that produce them. 
which is an inquiry not belonging to the idea as it is in the understanding, but to the nature of the things existing without us. These are two very different things and carefully to be distinguished. It being one thing to perceive and know the idea of white or black, and quite another to examine what kind of particles they must be and how arranged in the surfaces to make any object appear white or black. So what, what are you getting out of this section? Um, it doesn't even necessarily have to be about this quotation, but what is he trying, what, what's he bringing out from, from, from this section we just read? Anybody have a guess? Think about the concept of like blackness. Do you have an idea of blackness? Do you, you know, that conjures up something in your mind if you want to think about it? Is blackness, like is black something or is black the absence of something? How about this? This is kind of related to this. Do you have a concept of what a hole is? Do you have an idea of what a hole is? Is a hole, is, are holes something or are holes the absence of something? You have the idea of cold. Is coldness, once again, a something or is coldness the absence of heat? Um, Locke is concerned in this part that not all of the positive ideas we have correspond to positive things. Another example he uses in this part of the book, he talks about shadows. Shadows are not like substantial real things. Shadows are once again the absence of light. It's the absence of light that happens to trace, um, you know, the shape that blocks the light. You know, and that's how we do it. Yeah. See. So shadows are not something, they're the absence of light. How do we get he's concerned that we get these positive ideas of things, like we positively have a concept of a whole, of darkness, of cold, of shadows. But that doesn't mean that our ideas necessarily correspond to something that really exists. So just having an idea about something doesn't tell you that that idea must correspond to some real existing thing. So what we need to do is reflect on this and figure out what, what, do our, what can we say about the nature, the fact that we have ideas, what can that tell us about reality? Just having an idea is not enough to tell us that it's real. We need to be able to think about which ideas correspond to reality or not, or how to analyze that relationship. Does that make sense? Just because you have an idea, you have an idea of what a whole is, that doesn't mean a whole is something. You have an idea of what space is. That doesn't make space something. Space might be the absence of things, right? So, for this reason that we have these ideas that may not correspond to actual existing things, or that may not correspond to positively existing things, we need to distinguish ideas as they exist in a person's mind and the qualities that exist in material objects that cause us to have these ideas. If we can make those distinctions, that will actually help us make sense of this problem. Um, and we will actually be able to, we won't fall into skepticism. It will help us understand the nature of the world and everything around it. So, all of this then is to say, let's think about qualities of objects. Look on section 8 on 333. This is another short one. I'm going to read this one in its entirety. And somebody pay attention. Let me know, what is he, how does he define a quality? So, whenever the mind perceives in itself or is the immediate object of perception, thought, or understanding, that I call idea. 
And the power to produce any idea in our mind I call a quality of the subject in which the power is. Thus, a snowball having the power to produce in us the ideas of white, cold, and round, the power to produce those ideas in us as they are in the snowball I call qualities. And as they are sensations or perceptions in our understandings, I call them ideas, which ideas, if I speak of sometimes, is in the things themselves, I would be understood to mean those qualities in the objects which produce them in us. So what's an idea? Or what's a quality? Mm -hmm. The power to produce an idea? A quality is the power to produce an idea in our mind. Sometimes, what Locke calls qualities, today we talk about properties. Um, and maybe this won't actually be a perfect fit, but let's roll with that for a moment. Which is to say, you know, there are properties of your book. Like your book, it's kind of rectangular. What do we mean when we say it's rectangular in Locke's sense? That means that this book has the power to produce in your mind when you look at it the idea of rectangularity. Um, the, uh, you know, a lot of you have, have drinks on your desk. All those things have all sorts of interesting qualities. They cause you to have ideas about the way they taste, the way they smell. Um, the bottles that they are held in have the power to produce in us the ideas about the shape of it, the way it feels. Um, so, a quality is just the power that something has to produce those ideas in our mind. He next distinguishes between primary qualities and secondary qualities. Primary qualities are those qualities that are in material objects and are utterly inseparable from them. So these are the ideas that they produce in us that describe the, act, the way that the objects are in themselves. So your book, when I say it's rectangular, that's a primary quality. It produces the idea of rectangularity, and it is a part of the substance of the book. It, you cannot, it's not separable from this book. Um, the fact that your book is a solid object is also a primary quality. That this book is a solid entity, you can't, you know, something can't pass through it. That idea is, that's produced in us describes the way the book is in its own self. You can't separate the solidity from the book. Um, he talks about motion being another one of these. Um, if the book hopefully is at rest, it's not moving. Um, that is describing the nature of the book itself. It's not, um, it's, it's not illusory. Um, and number, what he means by that is like there's, you have the idea there is one book here, not two or three or four. That, that since there is, yet it forms in your mind the idea one book, that is a description of that substance. In contrast to primary qualities, there are secondary qualities. Now, secondary qualities are qualities in objects that produce ideas in us. But you'll notice that these ideas that they produce in us are not in, the ideas are not in the, the, the substances. So these would include things like colors, sounds, tastes, scents. These are things that objects cause you to have ideas of, but they are not in, the, these ideas are not really a part of the substances themselves. Let me see if I can illustrate it this way. Out in the world, this is a lemon. And when you, in, when you encounter a lemon in the right way, it causes you to form certain ideas about it. You form two kinds of ideas about the lemon. Primary Ideas that are formed as a result of primary qualities and ideas that are formed as a result of secondary qualities. The ideas that you have of a lemon that are its primary qualities involve that kind of oval, spherical shape of it, that it is one entity, and in this case it's not moving. 
Those are all qualities that are that are in the object itself. The lemon has those qualities, even if you're not around to experience them. It also produces these other kinds of qualities, like that the lemon is yellow, that the lemon is sour, that the lemon is firm. These are ideas it causes you to, to have, but these ideas are not in the lemon itself. These are ideas that only exist in your conscious experience of the lemon. That these ideas don't correspond to, a, to the reality of the lemon itself, it just corresponds to your experience of the lemon. So, <clears throat> color, so this is really interesting to think about, is that color is not a real feature of the world, according to Locke. Colors are more of like a psychological byproduct that we have because we encounter things in the world. But the world, in and of its true nature, if you were to encounter the world as it really exists, it would not be colored at all. <clears throat> After all, colors can change. Colors are different uh, on different lighting conditions. If we had different rods and cones in our eyes, we would see colors differently. Couldn't those <coughs> primary qualities change, though? Like, um, like what if somebody, I mean, it's <coughs> obviously not very probable to happen, but never experienced a real, like, oval, spherical-shaped lemon. Like, they just only saw, like, a slice of one like mm -hmm. that you put on a, mm -hmm. like, a cup or something like that. And they had no idea, of, like, of the any of the primary qualities. Yeah. Like, the shape could be changed or... And what we'd say of the, we, we would give us a, a similar kind of account, but just of the wedge, right? So it would, the shape would, instead of being oval, spherical shape, it would be that kind of like crescent, um, you know, wedge shape. So would it still be a lemon, though? Yeah. I mean, we might get technical and talk it's maybe a part of a lemon or a piece of a lemon. Right. But in a way, that's not what, we I don't want to focus too much on, like, Locke isn't thinking about, like, universal knowledge of lemonhood here. <laughs> <laughs> He's thinking more about particular knowledge of, like, this thing in front of me. What is that particular thing? Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. But if you haven't ever, like, experienced the shape of, like, like a square for something else or a rectangle mm -hmm. for a book, then you wouldn't be able, then that wouldn't be able to be a primary quality for you. You know what I mean? But you would get it the minute that you have the experience. So Locke's not saying that you could conjure up any of this apart from experience. He's saying in the moment of experience, when you're looking at the object, this is what's going on. Is he saying that uh, primary qualities point to reality, whereas secondary would point to our perception? Yes. Of reality? So this is one thing that you should be, we're, we should be moving to as we're thinking about that initial problem of like knowledge of like holes and darkness and cold. Is that he's trying to start to sift out how there are some things that describe the way things are in their real nature. And then there are some things that are just sort of psychological byproducts of our experience. And that we should attribute reality to the primary qualities and not attribute reality to the secondary ones. Yeah? Would the porous texture be a primary quality or a secondary quality? Or could it be both? It depends on how you want to describe this. So this would be the case almost for all these qualities, which is that if what you mean by the porous texture, the way it feels, like when that sensation you get when you rub your fingers across, that would be secondary. But if what you mean is like the surface structure itself, like the way that the molecules are arranged that creates that texture, that would be a primary quality. And that's the way to really think about this. The reason why I did this in black and white is to, to highlight that color is not a second, is not a primary quality. What Locke says are real, in a way, I mean, this is me kind of updating the science a little bit, but is that essentially what exists are molecules arranged in certain ways. When these molecules are arranged in certain ways, they causally interact with our senses, and we have been wired in certain ways so that when we interact with a lemon, it causes us to have these ideas, like that it's yellow and that it's sour. But we could have been wired differently. We could have been wired such that when we bite into a lemon, it tastes sweet, like an apple. Or that instead of seeing it as yellow, it could look, that would be the inverse on the color scale there. I don't know what that would be, but like orange or something, maybe not. Let's say orange. That 
you know, you don't have to, it wasn't the case that it had to be this way. But even if we even if we all experienced the lemon in different ways, it would still have to have this structure in reality that causes all of us to have those ideas. Yeah. What would you say to somebody who's like never who looks at like a baby who's never seen a baby before and then looks at someone who's elderly? Because a baby is obviously like yay tall, mm -hmm. and then an elderly person's obviously a lot bigger and looks different than a child. Would you say the same? Would that be like a primary quality or? So in this case, what you're kind of raising is more a question about the general nature of human beings, right? Yeah. He would. And I think in this case he would say that that is something that we wouldn't, it would take more study to figure out. Okay. That you wouldn't be able to, on his view, connect those dots right away. That for all you know, I mean, that you would just say, well, you know, I know what they're like when they're born, I know like what they're like when they're older, but I don't know the in-between. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why is sperm a secondary quality? When I mean by firm, I mean like the sensation of like when you grip it. Okay. So... So would like a primary quality be like how actual hard it is? Yeah, so like we could call the primary quality like the, you know, the solid, that it's solid, or perhaps describe it that way. So when you look outside and you see the grass is green, the grass is not really green. The only sense in which we say the grass is green is what you mean is the grass has the power within it to cause me to experience greenness when I look at it. But it's not like when you stop looking when you when you stop looking at the grass, it no longer has the sensation of like bright green in it. The bright green is something that is only in your mind. It makes a little more sense actually with taste for a lot of people. That the sourness of the lemon, it's not like that sensation exists in the lemon and like it like feels sour when you're not tasting it. Um, the sensation of the sourness <laughs> is only something that exists in your mind. And it just happens that this, configure, this molecular configuration of a lemon, when it touches your taste buds, causes you to have the sensation of that sour experience. But it's not like the sourness itself is inside the lemon and it's feeling sour and you're just tapping into that when you bite into it. Other questions about this. Sometimes the easiest way to make sense of what's going on is to ask, you know, these sort of like, okay, what about this? What about that? Yeah. You might have said this already, but is he going to get into like the qualities, or are we going to talk about what the qualities of the soul would be? You know, this is uh, this is something we're going to talk a little bit about in this reading. Um, just as a preview, he's going to be very he's going to be very non-committal on that. Other thoughts? Um, so one of the things he wants to say is that the ideas that are produced by secondary qualities do not really exist in material objects. So the sensation that you get, you know, the taste, the scent, the feeling, is not really, those qualities are not inside objects, those are only inside your experience. The primary qualities, though, that we get resemble attributes that really exist in material objects, like the shape, the motion, the number of things. Those qualities um, really do exist. So the, the age-old question, you know, if a tree falls in the forest, no one is around, does it make a sound? Locke, in a way, kind of has a way of answering that. What he would say is that if nobody is there to experience the tree falling in the forest, you have you know, the motion and the shape of the tree, all those things really exist. There are sound waves that are generated as a result of that. But is there the sensation of sound, that crashing noise, does it exist? No. You'd have to have a human observer there, and if they observed it, then those primary qualities would cause the observer to have the, the experience of the sound. Yeah. So Locke is going along with the idea that the senses are just tricking you all the time to perceive, perceive uh, primary qualities as he puts it in a certain sense. 
I don't, he would want to stay away from the word tricking. He doesn't think that it's all this like grand illusion as much as just with a little bit of thought, we're able to tell that secondary qualities are only in our experience, but the primary qualities that we get through experience are real. And maybe as an interesting test case, you could ask, how could you have the idea of shape without the idea of color? But the shape is the primary quality, the color is the secondary one. Um, let's take a look at section 15 here, the way that he describes primary qualities as being real. So this is another short one here. He says, um, ideas of primary qualities are resemblances, um, of, oh sorry, this is the section heading, of secondary not. All right. From which I think it is easy to draw this observation that ideas of primary qualities of body are resemblances of them, and their patterns do really exist in the bodies themselves. But the ideas produced in us by these secondary qualities have no resemblance of them at all. There is nothing like our ideas existing in the bodies themselves. They are in us, I'm sorry, they are in the bodies we denominate from them only a power to produce the sensations in us. And what is sweet, blue, or warm in idea is but the certain bulk, figure, and motion of the insensible parts of the bodies themselves, which we call so. He goes on to give a couple of examples to try to help us with this as well. So the next section he talks about fire. One of the qualities, one of the ideas that fire can cause in us, get if you get too close to the fire, it can burn you and cause you pain. Do you think pain is in the fire? Do you think pain, like the fire is experiencing pain? I hope not, right? I mean, that sounds really strange. Um, if you get at a nicer distance from the fire, it gives you pleasure. If it's that like nice, warm kind of campfire feel that we like, we enjoy that. It's pleasurable. Is pleasure in the fire? Well, guess what? Are both pain and pleasure simultaneously in the fire? Locke wants to say, of course not. Pain and pleasure are not things that the fire itself has. Pain and pleasure are the, the ideas the fire causes us to have. But pain and pleasure don't resemble fire in any way. This also would go for this idea of like warmth. The feeling of warmth or heat is not in the fire. The, the feeling is only in our experience. What he would say is that fire does have a temperature. Like temperature is just measured by the average kinetic energy of the, the motion of the particles. So that's what, if you want to say that the fire has temperature, he's fine, but the fire doesn't have like warmth. Um, he says that Fire, uh, that primary qualities, we, one reason we think of them as the real qualities is because they, they would exist even if, the, um, even if all the secondary qualities were stripped away. Um, so those primary qualities actually are what make us have the secondary qualities. We have, secondary, we have these ideas of secondary qualities because the primary qualities in objects caused us to have those ideas. In section 21, he gives this really neat idea, this really neat thought experiment. This actually predates Locke, from what I understand, by maybe a millennia. But Locke gets a lot of credit for this. We're not going to read this section. I'll just explain it to you. Take two hands. Put one in cold water and one in hot water. And then in, in a third pail in front of you, there's like lukewarm water. If you take, after you soak your hands for a couple minutes in both, and you put them both in the lukewarm water, what will they feel like? What will the, the hand that was in cold, what will it feel? Warm water. And one that was in the hot water? Cold, cold. Is the water in front of you simultaneously hot and cold? No. That would be contradictory. You can't have both hot and cold in the same thing. What is, what's going on there? Well, that shows that hot and cold feelings are not in objects, they aren't just in your experience. 
you can have sort of two separate experiences, because this is an experience with a cold and an experience with a hot hand. So would the fact the water is lukewarm be its primary quality, and then the secondary would be the quality that you're experiencing cold and warm? Yeah. I mean, the only thing I would, when you talk about lukewarm, all I would want to modify that as is just, once again, that's not a feeling, it's not how it feels, it's more about how the average kinetic motion of the molecules in there is measured. Because it would have that average kinetic motion, even if you weren't in there feeling it. But that sensation of hot or cold you get out of it is only something that you get because you are experiencing it. And there's nothing special about the water feeling hot or cold. It's relative to you. Like, that same water could feel hot to somebody and it could feel cold to someone else. Have you ever been, like, to somebody's house that has, like, a hot tub next to a pool? And you can go, you can sit in the hot tub for a while, and then when you get up and you jump in the pool, the pool feels really cold. But somebody else who wasn't in the hot tub might think the pool feels fine. That's because the feeling you get is not in the pool, it's in your experience. Um, any questions, comments about the distinction between primary qualities? and secondary qualities, and how this is actually supposed to be helpful for the way that our ideas inform us about the reality outside of us. Yeah? Not exactly the distinction, but how... I don't know how to really put this. How does this not... How is like the idea of primary qualities not sort of like neo -platonism? What do you mean by that? Like, because he's saying that they exist. So what he means is, is that outside your mind. So the key thing there is that they resemble, not the the, I, the idea is that they cause us to have <laughs> resemble the qualities in the things. So he doesn't want to say that the the rectangular the thought of rectangularness is in the book, but what the idea of rectangularness resembles a quality in the book. So all he wants to say is that the, the reality that he's talking about has is grounded in the particular things themselves. Okay. Any other thoughts on this? You may have a test question about it, so don't leave don't leave here without figuring this out. I'll be posting your study guide for the test. Don't forget the first hour of next class will be dedicated to the test. The next two hours, the rest of the See you then. So just to straighten this out.